good decent bit right on my first uh, first few frames and that, that last dream excellent so I'm just getting around buzzing around and setting things up here um, I'll talk about icicle in a bit uh, and community stuff just bear with me just to sort some things out the stream So to start off with, I'm going to be working on Icicle, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. One of the things that I need to do is, um, I've literally today just finished most of the uh, routing. It's rather cramped, so let me just switch over. Why can't I see that? That's schematic. Oh, DRC errors. Don't really want to look at those yet. Hmm. Why can't I see those? Right, let me just get the CAD on the screen. Uh, do, do, right, let's just get rid of these. Just enlarge this slightly. So you can see what's going on. Okay. So there's a number of things I need to do on this this evening. Um, one of the things I need to do is sort out the silk screen layer. So let's just kill some of this stuff so we can see the wood for the trees. Yeah, let's just kill the bottom first, we don't need that on, anything on the bottom, we just get rid of for the moment. Okay. 
What else can we get rid of? Let's take out those vials. Don't need to see that. But what we do need is our top two names. Start with that. That let's First thing I'm going to do is just um, get the right font, so I'm just going to select none, and then I'm going to select the names, and then I'm going to do a font change. I'm going to select all of these. Um, And I'm going to change the font vector change group. I think we actually have done it. Let me just double check here. Let's put the um, origins back on. Select them all and change the group font. We have to use a vector font. Hopefully, now we look at it. Let me, let me just smash them all first. Oh, do 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 do. Um, can I do this from? Yeah, sure I can. One smash and smash group. Here we go. And reselect so that I'm selecting the text. Hopefully, I can then change the damn font. Let's just see now if no, it's not worked. Hold on. Where did go? And I just select these, and then I do change once more. Change vector. Change group. Now, hopefully. Vector, yes. And the other thing I'm going to do is just change the size because they're a little large. Oh, my size. So we've now got them in the right font and the right uh, sort of size, hopefully. I might be able to fit them in now. So I'm going to turn back the layers so that we can see what we're doing. So let's have a full nude pads on. Fires, I'm not that worried about. Dimensions, top place. Yep. And then. What are we missing here? Top 
Then... Okay. Right, so we're now looking at the layout um, minus some of the other guff. Oh, don't need those pads. Let's just take that away. The less we can see, the better. And now I can start lining these up. It is one of those things that uh, you have to do with these layouts as one of the uh, latter jobs is start getting the silk screen organized. Can be fiddly um, on a very dense circuit. This isn't too bad actually, even though it's a small board. That's in here. So um, let's just start by placing these. Um, it might be worth adding in. Some of the bits we can physically see on the board. Um, to place. What else have we got on the T dock reference? Let me just see. That is this okay. Document. Let's go from there. And I'll talk through this in a little bit as well. Let me just get started with some of the um So RN6 in this case, I'm going to have to renumber these as well, just for the uh, That's the uh, resistor array for the RGB LED here, uh, which I noticed doesn't have a number, so we'll have to fix that shortly. Let me get also, what will help here is we will be adding the report. I can see where they are. Right, Four, seven. Now that's a hole there. If we look carefully, what I don't have turned on at the moment on the bottom, we've got a um, an SD card. So if I just turn that on. And you can see the underneath. So this hole here is really um, it's a mounting hole to stop it moving around. It's actually mounted on the base of the board, the SD card. So I'm going to need to put that to one side, or you, you're just not going to see it. It's going to fall in the hole and be cut out. Uh, R7. The LED here is for. can't see some of the um, socket here, it's worrying me. Let me just turn an extra layer on just to see what I'm missing here. Mm. Okay, I'm going to turn that on and I'm going to get rid of the polyfill. Hold on. Let's just turn this off. So it's just going to confuse things and let me just undo that. Okay, 
and we can see some bits and bobs here we can see where the pads are RN6 Try and avoid covering the pads. Um, why has this got a label of P? What's the charge LED? the battery might need to make both of these smaller actually it's pretty tight in there I see two here. Okay. It's not smashed. Put that on the side here. Uh, four, four. What's this C12? Damn, this is tight. I knew it was going to be a little bit fiddly. Often is. Keeping those key counts actually not helping. Oh, four. Let's do one. Can go up here. That probably is the pads. Can cut that short. So again, shrink it down. Hi Nori. Uh, yeah, Laurie's asking, what's IC2? Let um, me just get the chat where I can see it because I almost missed it then. IC2 uh, here is just the um, for the USB it's ESD protection let me show you in the schematic if I can there we go basically a bunch of diodes um, just notice we don't have schematic on the screen let me just edit that So there on the screen, it's here. Look, this is Puppy IC2. Basically, uh, it's a whole series of diodes on the D plus and D minus lines that uh, provide voltage protection. So if the voltage is exceeded, they conduct very quickly, very low capacitance diodes. They're like four picofarads or something really small. But they have to be for the USB speeds, otherwise they would interfere with the uh, signal integrity. So the EDM and EDP, that's external, i.e. the USB connector side uh, of the minus signal and the positive signal, um, 
there are diodes going both to ground and the V bus, so it protects against negative going and positive going. Uh, voltage spikes and ESD, etc. So it's a bit of protection, really. That's what IC2 is. That puppy there. You don't have to put those in. Those are completely optional. They're actually very low cost. Normally the problem is just squeezing everything in. Luckily I managed to be able to fit that in. But it does provide a bit of protection. Stops the uh, IO lines. USB I.O. lines on the microcontroller, in this case ESP32, stops it from uh, receiving extraneous volt voltage, particularly about 3.3, but the very high voltage things that can hit any cable, basically. It's always good to have protection on your comms lines from the outside world. Let me just turn off the bottom because that's starting to make things look... complicated okay all uh, right let me forget where I am now line where was I C12 D1 I just did I think didn't I so let's carry on with that D1 there try and avoid going onto the pads if possible um what are the pads sure um, the other thing I can do is rather than turn the top on, I can actually should be just turn on the stop or cream that will show us a similar similar view but without all the tracks in the way. Okay. Um, D1. So uh, working our way round and round. So what have we got here? C2. God, we're tight in here. Damn. And R3. Hmm. Let's make me smaller. Maybe I should have just made them all smaller. It's like we're going to end up making a lot of them smaller anyhow. This is a bit of a laborious task. It has to be done. Not just for presentation purposes. You know, at some point we're going to ask people to put these together. It's a good idea to know which component is which. I have to make these smaller. Eleven. The joys of hardware. Under here. And probably worth making these a tad smaller. I'd like to get this off, or at least finish tonight. Um, don't know if I have a chance to actually send it off. I'm going to do these through um, JLPCB, and I can show you that step as well. If people are interested. But later on, if we do well. It's all a bit smaller. Uh, 
Wait a minute. That one goes there. Right. This is going to get confusing. I tend to find this is a bit of a iterative process. damn tight in here that's the other thing that you find when you go for these smaller boards you have very little room at all very little indeed hmm. Um, yeah, this is going to be extremely tight. Where am I going to put that? Let's just make it smaller. There's a bunch of things I want to cover on this. Talk about why I've chosen certain things on this board. Um, when I get some of this sorted, I'll be able to uh, talk about them. Just neaten it up a little bit first so we can actually see the wood for the trees. And I shouldn't call these US free. It's really annoying they get called that. Uh, what is that? Oh, it's, um, it's a ferrite bead. Tight, tight, tight. It's already starting to look a bit better. I'm actually starting to make some sense out of it, which is good. We can refine as we get a bit further. In fact, and if I can fix like that. Laurie, you may notice that I actually changed the name. Oh, no, this is, this is tricky. Um, when Laurie saw this, I did I actually did a test stream last week on um, Friday evening. And a few people were kind enough to join me on my initial efforts at streaming. Um, it was a bit of a disaster to start off with. I just couldn't get any decent frames per second. It was oscillating between, I don't know, uh, 500k per sec and zero at a very high frequency, which most basically meant most of the frames did not get through. There was an occasional frame, but that was it. And I tried all sorts of different things, but in the end, Ed worked it out, Big Ed on the forum, worked it out with the uh, normal suggestion, the obvious suggestion. Who you tried turning it on and off yet? Referring to my meter, which was the last thing I tried. I tried the um, Ethernet switch, computer restarted, restarted OBS, the whole caboodle. Um, but yeah, it was a router. Um, so yeah, after having restarted it and had it reconnect, bingo, we're up to normal 
scan rates. And I'm, I get about 2.5 gigabits per second consistently here. So it um, tends to be pretty good, which is why I was so surprised, so surprised getting um, so many problems then. <clears throat> but yeah, turn it on and off again. The only trouble with doing that with the router, of course, is that um, it takes a while to reconnect to do its negotiation. Right, RN2. I don't want to go over the name. Let's put it there for the moment. I might need to come back to that. These need renaming. Hold on. Which is which here? Let's go. Um, the normal black eye standard was red, yellow, green. So let's stick to that. Uh, G. Um, unlike black ice, we only have three LEDs connected to the. Um, damn it! Done it the wrong way around. That should have been yellow or amber. That should be green. So we have our red yellow green our traffic lights but we don't have the blue on the end like we do with the uh, um, black eyes so that's one minor change the reason for that is quite simple because if you look at the ice 40 the 5k chip in the qfn 40 package it has three LED drivers, which is what I'm utilizing here. Um, these are effectively open drain outputs, but there is some um, dedicated hardware inside the ICE40 chip that you can engage um, that basically provides um, like a PWM current modulation on those pins there we go red yellow green LEDs so I'm using those three um, open drain outputs to do this they're also exposed on the connector and I need to talk a little bit about that in a minute as well this is tight again there's a lot of tight spots on this board that are making it a little bit tricky. The best I can do. P mod. I need to explain this as well. That would be a good idea. Let me just. Is that. Could be okay. We don't need that one, actually. Oh. Let me just go back here. So that's... I need to explain these connectors a little bit. So the board itself is arranged um, as a feather board. Um, or oh, please introduce yourself if you're viewing just on the chat. Just let me know who you are, guys, and I'll call out to you. Not compulsory. Just 
nice to know who's watching so this is the clever connector lower effectively um, I'm probably just going to delete that but from a naming point of view probably useful Um, that's the feather connector upper now feather boards were developed standard was developed by adafruit um, in fact let me just give you so, so that you can have a look Uh, hopefully here well there's examples there you can scroll down and see um, there are lots of these small boards let me just see if I can just give you a quick uh, view of this hold on Here, um, let me just show you what's on there. I know I'm blocking myself out, but the feather boards themselves are quite interesting because they're very small, compact, um, they're based on 0 0.1 inch. Uh, headers that are spaced actually I believe at 0 0.9 inches or 9 0.1s um, so you can put them in breadboards you need a damn big breadboard for them though because they're actually quite wide but I what I've done with them in the past is use two breadboards on either side uh, which is a good trick um, but the cool thing about them, they were a very simple uh, set of lines. That the the IOs are a mixture of analog, predefined GPIOs for SPI, UART, and I squared C, and the rest are just general purpose IOs. And there's a few control pins as well. There's like an enable pin. There's a V battery pin. And if you look at those boards there. Uh, here, for example, you can see that there's a JST 2mm spaced battery connector on there, which is quite useful. Uh, and there's a little charging chip that you, that you need to put in to support that, which I've got on the board as well. So it's a great little chip. The, this subset of pins is it's a bit like a miniature Arduino, really. You've got um, effectively six. Uh, I think six ADCs, Mozzie, Miso, SCK, SDA, SCL, TX, and RX, and the rest are GPIOs. Um, you can also see here there's all sorts of different things that plug into the board, which is kind of handy. So you're plugging into something that is, you know, fairly standard in that cell. Let's just. Uh, And I wanted to do a miniature board for ages, so you can look at one of the examples here of a Feather IO. Oops, that's not in there. There we go. I don't know if I can make that bigger. 
might just about be readable so here on the left hand side you've got um, uh, at the top you've got a reset signal then you've got a uh, basically a three volt power you've then got a pin which tends to be used as a ref but it can be used as gpio i'm, I'm outputting a uh, external reset signal for resetting things it's normally pulled up to three volt free so it can be used as a VRF as well then you've got ground then you've got six analog signals you know just like the green ones here and then you've got um SCK MISO sorry SCK Mozzie MISO for your SPI and then you've got RX and TX and you've got another line here which can be ground or you can use this as a GPIO as well uh, I'm using this um, I've got a pin on here if you're not using the SD card this is the uh, active low CD card select so if you're not using the SD card on the underside of our board you can use it as an IO here uh, but again this is one of the optional pins not one of the core pins on the feather standard uh, and then on the other side of the connector, it's just general purpose IOs. In fact, nearly all of those are also multiplexed with uh, ADC pins, except one. One of them is a um, one is the um, mode stroke boot pin, which is also connected to one of the buttons on our board on the icicle. And then the three above these, um, you've got the USB, so that's the uh, five volt from the USB. You've got enable which can be used to disable the onboard power here for power saving purposes and then you've got the battery which is the same as the uh, positive on the battery here um, and then you can charge your battery over usb using the standard chip so it's a very simple pin out very small usb as standard uh, and they're great little add-ons etc for that so let me just get rid of that again. Back to the PCB. Um, so I wanted to do a small board, but rather than just come up with some random pinout, um, I figured it would be a good idea to actually use a pinout that was in some way standardized. And the feather made sense from that point of view the feather standard it's got all the basics that you need had the right sort of number of uh, pins so all those pins that are populated on the feather side are actually driven by the microcontroller on our board which is in this case it's esp32 i did want to make this board for a long long time a small mini kind of black ice in fact this was originally going to be called black ice ultra um, but it's moved quite a distance away from black ice um, hence giving it a completely different name like icicle and this is definitely aiming you know at the more of the entry level markets uh, unlike the black edge stuff which we'll cover in, in later streams that we're working on which is the kind of higher end stuff and then black ice kind of sits in between these, these two different ones um, so in, di in addition to those connectors to the microcontroller pins on the ESP32 um, we've also got some pins on the right hand side here we just switch back to the CAD. So on the right hand side here we've got the pins. All of these are connected to the FPGA. Um, so those can go downwards through the base of the board. So this can actually be placed onto a carrier board, like a hybrid feather carrier board. So it will expose the other feather pins uh, or feather sockets, probably one either side. And then I'll have enough pins to actually expose one mix mod. Um, a mix mod is basically four half P mods together, plus four analog signals, um, five volt and ground, in addition to the normal P mod. 
signals. So that means that that connector will then take uh, either PMODs or mix mods um, as is, is used on the Black Ice MX right now. Those are the MX connectors. The MX stands for mixed signal, by the way, or mix mods. Uh, unlike the PMOB, which is primarily digital. So um, on the right hand side, the, 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 those eight FPGA pins are exposed that can go down through the board. Uh, onto a say a carrier <coughs> we actually sorry not eight 16 we actually on the right hand side here you can actually see we're using eight of those in a standard right angle double p mod so you don't need a carrier to use the small double p mods here um, the eight pin p mod so there's all sorts of p mods that go in here in fact, uh, I had a conversation on Friday talking with Ed, and in particular Laurie, because we remembered, you know, Laurie was asking, how do we connect if we wanted to HDMI? VGA is quite simple, but how do we connect to HDMI if you've only got a PMOD of that dimension? Most of the HDMI connectors have like a quadruple PMOD, so there's two lots of those, which we will be able to do with a mixed mod carrier board, but not. With this standalone well there is a board out there um, that bml did um, that is a single p mod format that fits in there i think the difference is is the color space is limited on it i think it's 8-bit color rather than 24-bit so you probably wouldn't want to use it for uh, full color stuff but if you're using it for retro um, that color palette's more than big enough nine times out of ten so it's a good solution for that. Um, the only thing I'm worried about is how you get hold of them. I'm sure Peter was selling them at uh, one bit squared, but I couldn't find them listed on his site. He's only selling the 24 bit uh, version. So I will investigate whether we can actually source some of those. Uh, if we can't source them, uh, it was an open source design by BML anyhow. So uh, there's no problem with us recreating that. Uh, and it's a uh, it's like a single chip solution. It's very simple. What you can't do with this, you can do with the higher end chips like um, the uh, ECP fives and stuff, is drive the um, HDMI signals directly. The I/O fabric just isn't really fast enough for that. So you do need the chip in between. You can also just do VGA if you want to, uh, fairly easily for this setup. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other PMODs that will fit on here, you know, dip switches, seven segment, um, you know, UARTs, CANVAS, you name it. There are literally uh, tens of different things that can plug into that PMOD without even adding any other carrier. So it's a fairly flexible format in that sense. Just finish moving some of these around, uh, and I'll talk a bit more about some of the other stuff. So, the ice, ice no, that's the name of the connector, uh, ice IO. Go there, to... yes, no one, you have to take me down. Uh, I see. Four. Let's do I see four. Um, the reason I don't like them being called U dollar and then number, which is for some, on some of these, um, quite standard. Bear with me a sec is um, the fact that at some point I want to renumber these components so they actually make sense because the position of the uh, lettering and numbering is kind of a bit random because things have moved around so much. So I often do a renumber. Um, and when you do the renumber it hates finding those kind of dollar letter numberings in there and complains 
uh, when you run the renumber script. So why I have to change all of these? I'm going to have to make this a bit smaller. Hold on, where's this going? Can that go? Hmm. Yeah, what is annoying is that number four. Some of these connectors won't let you smash out the numbering. Where's that four from? That's weird. Come back to that in a sec. See, try on. Be a bit smaller. If you've got any questions, do fire away by the way. I am paying attention to the chat. I know there's not a huge amount going on there, but I am keeping my eye on it. If you want to ask. And that chat is the stream chat for um, Twitch. We are damn crowded in here. These two are super close. I have to check that on this one. Damn tight. That's what that is. It's slightly chaotic. Okay, it's starting to make a bit more sense. Let's get rid of that because those are going to be off board anyhow. These numbers won't appear. I know they're outside of the board. Still not perfect. I must have. Caught my thumb on something. <laughs> Laurie asks, I am looking at orange crab featherboard and don't understand how you seem to have more space on your board more space um if i remember the orange crab is an ecp5 board it's an amazing board uh, it's kind of a killer feather board because uh, it's somewhat overpowered i mean you're talking about a chip that's like um 200 or balls or something on it and the feather connectors only have like um, Oh, plus 16, 18, 28 pins, um, of which some are used for other purposes. Control pins, like six of them. So it's terribly overkill having it, but it's marvellous that he can fit that stuff on there. He's also managed to squeeze on some hyper RAM or something as well, I believe. However, you do pay for it. I think the price when I saw it was about $120, $130, something like that. Right, I'm going to have a look, Laurie. Let me have a look. I'm hoping that you haven't discovered something very odd. Um, orange crab. It's Greg's board. Uh, is it a good picture? I 
On the orange crab, this is what Laurie's saying, on the orange crab, the 16 pin header takes up all the space up to the corner holes. Ah, okay. Yeah, well, if you look at the corner holes here on the right hand side, I'd move them to the to ah to the right. It's that way on the video. Move them to the right. That's confusing. <laughs> so I've stretched it out. You're allowed to do that with the feather design. If you look at the feather guidelines, as long as you stick to this pin out, these are all the standard ones, and then you can add to the right. So that's that's what the primary difference is. That's why his 16th pin goes all the way up to the hole here. See, I've actually stretched it out just a tad, just to squeeze the FPGA pins in and the LEDs. I did have a design earlier on this. It was even more crowded. It had like a surface mount connector underneath that fitted the pins in between. But that causes problems if you want to put it on breadboards. So I decided not to. It was $99 when I got it. But US Postage and Customs doubles the cost. Yeah. I hate that crap when that happens. It's so annoying. You can... I'll tell you who's selling it in, the U, in Europe now is... Hold on. Let me find this. Uh, Peter's selling it. Um, I think he's selling it. Yep, hold on. Uh, one bit squared. Let me just find the link for people if they're interested in getting this. Oh, what's this? That's not these. Um, Visit European store. Yes, please. Uh, no, I don't. Oh, it's asking me in German. No, can I have English, please? Thank you very much. Accept all cookies. Uh, shop. So, click, 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 click. Oh. I can't see it there. Maybe, hold on a minute. Maybe it's not on page one. Here we go. Orange crab. Let me just paste this link and I can show you guys as well. Uh, there, one bit squared. So if you go to the European store, I don't know if he's got any in stock at the moment. Um, but this will avoid more expensive shipping in Europe if you want to get that. And he's selling it here at 129.95 euro. Here it is plus he says here you can see a very small writing 24.69 European VAT. I don't know if that includes shipping. You have to put it in the box. But that might be slightly better. You're not going to get stung for customs as long as you order before we Brexit here. If you're a UK citizen in Europe, you can do it whenever you like. But yeah, it's kind of cool how he fits all of that stuff in there. Um, but just to let you know, price wise, that's probably two or three times where the icicle is going to be. So it's an entirely a different league. Um, we will have an ECP5 board in the form of Black Edge. I've got a great new name for it actually. I came up the other day. But um, that, that is still being worked on. So just going back to the CAD. Hi Snooze Badger. What should I call you? Electrified. 
welcome welcome to the stream and uh, yeah I know your name from the forum but not not snooze badger <laughs> that's a new nickname a new identity yeah so the answer Laurie basically is I've stretched a design um, in order to uh, make this work so I'm cheating if you like but there is, it's a legal cheat uh, the Adafruit has some very good documentation on what you should and should not do when making a feather board um, they talk about all the things that you must do and then all the other things that you've got kind of freedom over so like there are certain pins like the SPI pins, UART pins uh, and a lot of the control pins that have to be in place and they like to have six analog pins and they prefer the order to be such and such and the first two to have DAX which I followed etc um, you must also have the JST 2mm connector on there for the battery and something to handle charging that which I've got um, so I'm following following the guides um, let me just talk through these chips on here as well so um, down here I better go over the whole thing I mean I don't know how many people missed the initial slide and some of you certainly didn't see the stream I did last Friday so let's talk about the board as a whole so um, it's in a feather form factor as I mentioned earlier it's called icicle so ice but small um, this little icon by the way is something I'm experimenting with it's a new icon for my storm uh, I need a bit more artwork on that yet but it's just a placeholder really to remind me the one of the things that I wanted to do for ages was do a board that had Wi-Fi I really 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 wanted to do that but couldn't do that in the past because the chips and modules that were available namely well originally when I started looking at this was two or three years ago um, it was the 8266 ESP 8266 the other problem with that is it only had one analog IO and a very limited number of IOs in total and it also had very little memory to be fair but it could have programmed the ice chip for that problem um, also there was a very small selection of decent chips to go on a small board um, from lattice at the time I mean I did do a board many moons ago um, here's a board I did years ago and I did make about 30 of these or something come on Cam you can do it you can focus I ordered another camera by the way to help us look at these boards a bit, a bit better but that's not coming for a while that's coming from uh, Ali so God knows what it's going to be like Oh, it's not going to play ball, is it? If I get it really close, if I take it back a bit, there we go. How close can I get it before it goes again? Yeah, about there. So, on that board, very small number of things, lots of headers and stuff. And this this preceded the mix mod, so it's almost like a mix mod on the bottom there, slightly different. Uh, but the key chip for this inside. Was it had a very small microcontroller in this case it was uh, an STM32 uh, M0 it's no 30070 it had USB and a tiny amount of memory actually and the ice chip in there was the um, the 384 gate chip it just turned out to be very limited at the time couldn't do Exactly what I wanted so I canned it uh, and didn't make them in uh, large quantities 
There is a possibility I will do kind of a slight improvement on this a bit later on. Um, but this was going to be called the Icicle or Zero at the time. But anyhow, um, they were very limited at the time. And then later we had the Ice 40, uh, the up 5k chips come out. And that really enabled some quite good features actually on on the FPGA that was supported by the hardware tool chain um, and it's got some great little features in it um, in a relatively small package in this case uh, the ice 40 is this puppy here uh, and it's like a 48 QFM package relatively easy to use get on boards if you want to build a board yourself so it's a nice nice little chip to play with um, it's got quite a bit of memory on it I think it's like 128k ish SRAM blocks plus it's got a few DSP units as well which is quite handy and there's 5000 gates there or thereabouts, just over 5,000 gates. So it's respectable, really, in a small package. It's not as fast as the chip we use on the Black Ice, uh, the HX series. Um, the logic inside these Ice 40 Ultra Plus chips, which is the range that they come from, is it's actually lower power than the HX more frugal in that sense but it's not um, um, not as fast I think we had a disconnect there My back on is C, it's reporting 2.5 gigabits. I don't know where I went, but OBS did notify me that it disconnected. Oh, number of viewers jumped, that's quite clever. It's got about seven people, I think, roughly. Laurie, can you confirm, or Snooze Badger, that the uh, stream's coming through okay now? And that the audio is okay, etc. Didn't do an audio check today, actually. Is the audio good, Laurie, by the way? That's pretty much the same as we left it last time. I haven't adjusted it. Right, sorry about that. So, yeah, I was talking about the Ice 40 uh, Ultra Plus, and in this particular case, uh, the Ultra Plus. 5k it actually comes in two packages there's, there's a 3k and a 5k the 3k is a smaller package thanks guys thanks for letting me know but the 3k is incredibly small let me <laughs> i'll have a bit of a laugh here let me just show you how incredibly small the 3k version of this chip is it's in a CSP package, so let me just add it in. Uh, if I can find it. Just for a laugh, I'll just put it in temporarily. So if you look at the CAD now, this is the chip. Oops. Can't actually grab it down here. Can you see how teeny tiny that is? Unbelievable. Um, why won't it let me grab that? Because I don't have origins on. Right, here we go. So, yeah, look at that compared to the QFN. <laughs> look at the size of the balls. 
Uh, I did try starting to do a design with this a little while back to see what would be possible. Uh, it's nightmarish, frankly. Uh, you need some very high spec PCBs. Um, and you need to do some clever stuff here. Luke Valentry did this with one of his boards where he kind of decircled and overlies the outer line connectors so that you can squeeze a, a line out between the two so you can escape the inner ones without paying silly prices on the boards. Anyhow, so there's a tiny 3K version of this chip, but it's just like so tiny. Uh, that's uh, a CFP chip. Um, which is basically the chip, basically the uh, chip with a length, whole set of balls on the back of it. Uh, there's very little packaging, if any. It's like the silicon almost directly. Anyhow, where was I? I've got sidetracked. Um, yes, so having a decent eyes chip that you can fit on a small board was one of the important things having support for that in the open source tool chain um so that was done as well thank you to i think it was dave uh, and a few others actually added that support in and the next bit was the wi-fi part how getting the wi-fi in so for the 8266 it didn't really have the adcs and the other pieces that I believe are kind of essential on these designs. Because so I'm definitely a mixed signal sort of person. I like to have the analog stuff in there, not just digital. So um, they then brought out the uh, ESP32s. Now these were much more sophisticated chips. Uh, when Expressive brought these out, they suddenly put something in front of me that was much more attractive. And I did have to play around with it with some kits and stuff that they bought. But the one thing that the ESP32 lacks, unfortunately, something that is pretty much essential for uh, development boards of this sort, is a USB connector. So I couldn't easily go with that without adding on a USB chip. And again, that adds to the bill of materials, adds to the cost, it takes up board space. It's just the kind of thing you don't want to have to add on along with everything else, particularly if you're working in a small space like this. But then finally, they announced, Expressive announced last, I don't know, September, October, something like that, a variant of the ESP32 called the ESP32-S2. Um, which did have OTG USB built into the chip, which meant that you wouldn't have to add on, um, you know, a USB UART type transceiver, the FTDI or the CHP um, converter chip. So suddenly it became possible. Um, and that is now becoming that's now shipping in quite large quantities and people are using this you can buy boards with this on I've got a great development kit and I'll talk about that probably ooh, uh, in one of the next streams maybe next week because uh, I'm using this to actually write some of the software um, and I need to talk about some of that as well um, and I use this for the uh, can read that. It's the Ultra Plus breakout board that's got a up 5k on it. So those two are what I use in combination. What I'm using to develop the software part of this because there's a big software story, and I'll come back to that again in a bit. So uh, we've got the ESP32 S2 on here. Um, and the USB connector. Hurrah! And as Laurie pointed out, we, IC2 here is the protection for that. Um, there's two buttons. 
on the bottom left here. One's a kind of reset, one's a boot. May lose the reset one at some point, but for some reason they like having these on the feathers. The boot can act like a boot and or mode pin. So we could do the same kind of thing we do with black eyes if we want to kind of put it into a flash mode. But we're probably going to have more software choices, to be honest, on this one. We might not need that. But that can also put it into a kind of DFU mode for reprogramming the microcontroller itself, uploading new firmware to it. Um, here we've got two um, SO8s or soy cake chips one of which is the regular flash type chip which is a 2 megabyte or 16 megabit flash um, which has plenty of room for not only for the image for the ICE 40 um, but also for the libraries that we're going to need to add on um, for the ESP32 etc as well and then the other one next to this is a Quad SPI flash, a uh, Quad SPI RAM. Uh, in this case, it's the 64 megabyte. Yeah, literally 64 megabytes. Would you believe it? That's huge. Um, obviously, it's not exactly low latency being Quad SPI, nibble at a time, so to speak. Um, but it's very well supported in the expressive uh, libraries, but not just the libraries, the expressive architecture has lent heavily on using external QSBI flash and RAM. Um, I don't know if you, for uh, since the 8266, I believe, which had an external ROM. Just a flash one, I believe. Let me just let the cat out. So, um, the internal memory arrangement of the ESP32 S2 is it has 128k of internal flash and it has 320k of RAM. So, it's really generous. Um, quite impressive what you get compared to the STMs for example and it's quite uh, price competitive as well especially given that you've got Wi-Fi among other things but having that 64 meg as an external is quite useful now the other thing that the uh, expressive has is it has an internal separate instruction cache and a separate data cache um, the original ESP32 just had um, mm, this is very annoying sorry about that OBS disconnected again. I don't know why it's doing that. Maybe it's a memory issue. Um, CPU wise, it's only using 11, 10%. It's not really doing a great deal. That's really weird. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the because it's got an internal instruction and data cache, it actually handles that uh, QSPI ROM and RAM quite well. Uh, it's not quite as slow as you'd expect, so it's actually pretty powerful. The processors inside, or processor inside this, it actually has internal, apparently, RISC V, doing some of the Wi Fi hard work and the back end, but you don't program those directly. Uh, what you program directly is the 32 bit extensor processor. Um, that will run it up to 240 megahertz, so it's no slouch. Pretty nippy, pretty impressive. So we've got a fairly well equipped um, setup here. Fairly powerful setup. 
Uh, oh, I've just noticed. I wonder if I can. I should move this. You're probably thinking, how is the Wi Fi done? Well, there is an antenna here, but I can't. I don't know if I can release that writing, which is annoying. Let's see. Oh. I might have to go in and edit that. Anyhow, this here, this chap here, is a 3D ceramic antenna, which gives it a little bit of lift above the board. I'm still messing about with the uh, different regions on here um, to try and keep any copper out of there. Um, there is going to be a little bit of interference from the wires, but remember these pins go below the board rather than above the board, so it kind of sits above those, which is nice. Uh, it's, this is going to be a learning experience, not having had RF on the board before. Um, I'm not using a matching network because the distance we're traveling between the uh, antenna connector and the antenna is very small, smaller than a quarter of the wavelength, but quite a long way. It's literally there, so it's a very short distance. Um, so that's going to be fun, uh, getting that working. But yeah, we're going to have Wi-Fi as well as um, USB. That's going to open up all sorts of different possibilities. The RGB LED here really gives us a status. So the done signal after programming the FPGA gets displayed here, for example. Uh, the power signal goes to that RGB LED and there's one kind of status line that comes from the FP32. So the color of this will vary depending on what state it's in, whether it's successfully um, program the FPGA or not, or whether it's got a valid uh, image for the FPGA to boot. Mm. It's very annoying that it keeps disconnecting and reconnecting. I'm wondering whether I should restart. Let me have a look at the memory. Bear with me a sec, folks. Apologies. Maybe I've got too much running here. Certainly not using much of the CPU. It's like 10%. Bit rate's good. 2.5, 2.6. Well, that's annoying. It's up and down like a yo-yo. I'm just wondering whether I should restart OBS. I'll give it a few minutes. If it goes out again, I'll restart OBS next time and then bring it back on. Sorry for the interruptions, folks. Very annoying. Don't know what's actually causing the outage. Telling me there's zero viewers. Is that right? Are you guys still there, Laurie? Snooze Badger? Seems to think it's still streaming okay.
yes it's lying to me it's back up to seven again uh the other thing i mentioned here is i might restart obs if it goes if it tries to reconnect again i don't know why it's reconnecting i don't think it's a network issue network seems fine crikey i just peaked at 3.3 .3 gigs well definitely not that okay um so 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 let me just turn these layers back on i've just gotten rid of a few things that were running as well does that made any difference so i finished laying this out earlier um Uh, let me turn the poly back on. And the wax mills, the poly fills. Boom, there we go. It does look more confusing when you look at it like this, particularly with the stop on. So let me get the stop off. Doesn't help at all. Uh, it looks a bit better anyhow. Uh, oh, you free. Damn it. Should be IC free and it should be smaller than that. This must be. Make that bit smaller. Uh, it looks a bit more cluttered because there is um, I've got the labels on for the tracks and things which just helps from the navigational point of view so this is more or less ready I'm going to do some changes but one of the things that I do here is take a look at how the fill is going so let's have a look at the top layer for example it's always good to check one's coverage of the board layer by layer. I, I normally do this in GURB, but I'm not going to run it in this case quite yet because that was using up quite a bit of memory. I just wonder if that was interfering with um, with this. Oh, let me show. I should show the pads as well. Okay. So you can see it's a busy little layout. So that's the top layer. Um, let's have a look. Let's move down. So even, even there we've got quite good ground coverage. What is a problem, however, is this down here, which I moved. That was below before. But at least we get some copper going through on the bottom here. You want as much copper flowing around on that ground plane as possible. Uh, there's a limit here. It's not all joined up. There are some islands. However, um, because this is a four layer board, we've got some good coverage there. So if we look at the uh, intermediate layer, that's, that's basically the uh, voltage, three volt and other voltages layer. So it's not really a signal layer, it's just moving voltage voltages around so the bulk of that is 3 volt free plain uh, but we've also got things like this which is the VUSB uh, going to here so it's 5 volts um, and that's for the LED charging LED which needs the 5 volt supply 
and then you've got a few others like here for example uh, is VCC which is uh, 1.2 volts for the FPGA internal core logic and then this one is 2.5 volts which is used for uh, both for the FPGA for the programming voltage strangely enough even though we're not really using that um, we do provide that on there it's also used for the uh, FPC cam camera connector which I haven't mentioned yet I should talk about what's on the bottom of the board as well but we'll see when we get to that bit in a sec um, this one is the uh, bus voltage for the SPIs and that's generated internally from the ESP32 so it can work at either 3 volt 3 or it's switched down to 1 1 volt 8 to get the maximum performance. The quad SPI, by the way, um, runs at for SDI it runs at 80 megahertz. For DDI it runs at 40 megahertz. Maximums these are. I know the processor is running at 240, but the quad SPI is limited down to about 80 of using STR. Um, so we've got good coverage on there. That looks good. Um, The next layer is a combination of signals and ground. Um, which provides quite some quite good ground coverage. And we've got wires going through underneath those chips on the um, ground pads. Um, they're also useful for dissipating heat, both into this layer across the board itself and onto the bottom layer as well. Um, you wouldn't normally put too much on these layers, you want as much ground plane as possible. Uh, the reason I'm doing it here is because it's very tight, quite frankly. Um, but I've tried to do my best to leave large areas of copper. So we're kind of one, two, and the third level in, in that sandwich. And then next one is the... Um, the bottom layer. So this is actually on the bottom of the board, the bottom copper. There's quite a bit here, but it's a bit more separated. So this section here is separated from this section. But internally, the chip ground coming all the way through through the wires is it is sharing um, some ground plane as well as the power supply area here, which is good. Now, the other thing is, some of this is still coming from underneath the antenna. I do have keep outs on some areas, and you can see that outlined here, but it's not keeping out everything. I've got to go in and just the keep out areas before I send this off for manufacturing. Because what you actually want under that antenna is just fiberglass. You do not want a ground plane. Or any copper, preferably, or anything conductive. I know it has three other feet for mounting, which are conductive, but you want to minimise that because it just interferes with the signal. It's actually a three-dimensional signal going through the antenna. There's also some components on the bottom here. Uh, these ones here are optional. This is for adding like the battery monitor using one of the ADC lines. You can also add what Adafruit call their one bit memory to tell whether it's been restarted or just powered. Um, I need to understand that better. I don't consider those essential, so they're on the bottom, so they don't have to be populated. But for the purposes of getting this board up and running, I wanted to provide those features in. Um, on here, you can see the footprint for the SD card. So the SD card goes in this way and that's a bit that's the same sort of SD card as the uh, ice 40 sorry the um, black ice in the same way that we have this underneath we've got the same thing going on here and then over this side we have 
pointing in the same direction as the SD card. We have an FPC connector. The FPC connector will accept um, parallel connected um, cameras. Let me give you an example. So this is the one that comes with the dev kit. Um, it's mounted on the board. You've probably all seen these. You can pick them up from Mali and all sorts of places. Let me just see if I can show you. If we can get it to focus. It's a wee camera on an FPC connector. So it accepts those cameras. Not the whole board like this, of course, because this is an adapter board. But they're very popular. Uh, basically, um, has an 8-bit interface, parallel interface, and some control lines. It has a pixel clock, has a H-sync, horizontal sync, and a vertical sync. And you also have to give it a um, a clock signal. You you effectively provide it with uh, a clock and like this board which has one on um, so we're providing it with the um, same clock that we're feeding into the FPGA which will likely be a 24 megahertz that in turn is generated by the microcontroller ESP32 on one of its clock output pins so the same trick that we used uh, on the black ice really with the STM32s, we're, we're kind of just repeating that exercise. No point in having a separate um, chip just to provide that when we can already do that from the, um, from the microcontroller itself, again less components. So that's kind of nice. So this board will attach the camera and that interface goes directly into the FPGA. Um, these cameras are pretty popular for attaching to the ESP32s. There's the C code out there for supporting them. However, you are taking a lot of cycles from the CPU when you plug that camera directly in. If it's only a microcontroller, um, you're a bit limited in what else you can do. So by having that go into the FPGA directly, um, there's the opportunity to have the FPGA offload uh, not only the conversations, the data um, exchanges over the 8-bit bus um, with the camera itself, but also the, um, the ICE-40 has DSPs. TSP units in. So there's all sorts of processing that can be done, pre-processing on the image, um, RGB filtering, resizing, packaging the data up ready, looking for very specific signals. And in fact, Lattice have dedicated an awful lot of time to what they call this low power uh, machine processing of um, small camera, um, low res camera captures. So there's quite a bit of HDL out there that does that. And there is now, I believe, some open source um, HDL out there for helping to deal with this. Basically, you can use the FPGA to, as, a, as an accelerator to do pre-processing camera images, offloading it from the processor itself to do the, the harder stuff. You can even use it to do basic machine learning, for example, relatively small uh, kind of categorization, classifications, those kind of things. So there's all sorts that you can do. So it's a bit like um, OpenCV only. In this case, you've got an FPGA to help you out which is kind of cool. Um, I won't have any of that stuff going for quite a long time, I shouldn't imagine, but I'm sure someone wants to get their teeth stuck into that part of it. So overall, you've got a fairly powerful um, little board, really. Let 
turn it all back on. Let me just turn off the um, poly fills for a second. If there was a command to do this, it'd be a lot easier. Now you can see the layers at work without their ground plane fills. Which makes it look a bit simpler, you can kind of see what's going on. So in terms of the, with the feather we've got the IOs we have. As I say, SPIO, we have the I squared C UART. Then there are six ADCs, plus there are another six on top, which can be either ADC or GPIOs, um, plus one extra input. On the FPGA side, we've got eight, um, 16, sorry, GPIOs available to us to do our bidding, so to speak. To be used for anything. This is above and beyond what they're already connected to in terms of the um, camera, etc. So we've got quite a lot we can do with this little puppy. Now, one of the important things that I wanted to achieve here is there's quite a lot to discuss on the software front, but one of the things that you do have to connect up. Something that's slightly different here from the black ice, this marks a departure really uh, from the way that we do the black ice because this is aimed squarely at bringing more people into building with FPGAs and learning with FPGAs. In order to do that, I have to narrow in and focus very carefully on some specifics. Whereas I tend to generalize very much with the, uh, uh, or Ken and I generalized with the uh, design of the black ice to have as many options as possible so that people could use whatever they liked. With here, this is definitely optimized for specific use case scenarios. That's not specific applications, but the way that the software is going to work, etc., is different. So, for example, I'm connecting that flash, that two megabyte, 16 megabit flash to the ESP32 S2. It is not connected directly to the ICE40. There's a very specific reason for that. So the ICE40 is always loaded from the ESP because I'm not anticipating using this whereby the FPGA is the, is basically the thing in charge the esp 32 is the thing in charge here it's responsible for looking after the fpga bringing it up and reloading it so the main core the von neumann part of this or harvard architecture actually in this case is what's in control that is the main core I'm not saying that there won't be any cores running in the ICE 40 FPGA, you can still put them in there. It's just they are effectively being run from the ESP32. So in order to do that, um, obviously there needs to be four basic lines need to go from the microcontroller to the ICE 40 for programming. These are the, effectively the SPI lines. Uh, and these are how we program the FPGA dynamically. Um, in addition to that, we need to control the reset pin and we need to look at something called the done pin. The done pin gives us feedback. So that signals back to us when it's happy with the image that it's been programmed with. So if we programmed it with an invalid image for whatever reason, or there was corruption in the bits as they were transmitted, then the FPGA will tell you by the state of the dump in, it will effectively say no then. So there's always six pins that are required for that 
conversation. Plus, normally we need to provide a clock signal for it to be of any use to anything running in the FPGA set 7. In addition to this, we've added another four pins. And what that enables us to do is talk from the ESP32 S2 to the FPGA using what's called OctoSpy. Uh, well, that's often referred to as OctoSpy in STM or ST land. Uh, it's certainly not called that in expressive land. They refer to it as spy eight line mode but basically you have a byte interface between the expressive 32-bit extensor and the fpga so in other words you can transfer a byte every clock cycle at 80 megahertz or you can transfer uh, ddr at 40 megahertz it comes to the same thing in terms of transfer rate um, but in, in terms of interfacing, um, the SDR is a bit easier on the logic side rather than DDR. That's fiddling with the uh, external I.O. parts on the FPGA. But having a byte interface is really useful because that means in one clock edge or one clock cycle, you can transfer a byte. So if you've got registers, for your FPGA peripherals that are being set by the ESP32, i.e. interactive address type um, peripherals, uh, one clock cycle is all you need to set those. That gives me the low latency that I was looking for. And that means it's like having internal peripherals in many ways. Uh, if you memory map it, which you can with the eight line mode in the expressive, not only will it uh, memory map it, you can also cache, although well, you probably want to turn that off most of the time over the peripheral bus because you want it volatile. If a register in the remote FPGA is changing because it's talking to something else, it will change and the expressive won't know. If it's doing caching on that, it will get it wrong. So you probably turn the caching off but the point is you can memory map the peripherals that you design inside the ice 40 so that they sit in the memory map of the expressive uh, and there's a byte interface to that which means a single clock cycle you can actually uh, set a register remote register even better still when you're doing more kind of if you're not just doing register type control of peripherals if you're doing high bandwidth peripherals say for example i wanted to do a um little graphics accelerator inside the fpga because i'm doing demo scene stuff and i want to be able to drive it from the expressive esp32 um, I can set the internal RAM up inside the ICE 40 as a dual port so it can be running the routines to output to say HDMI or VGA or an LCD um, at whatever clock rate and then I can be talking to that over the eight line the byte bus if you like between the two I can have effectively FIFOs etc and direct access I could actually memory map that VRAM sorry that virtual VRAM i.e. the SRAM inside the FPGA into the expressive memory map uh, and have the uh, because it's FIFO the clocks will be safely interfaced and I won't need to do much in terms of interaction it will be invisible um, and it will act just like a memory mapped frame buffer or that kind of thing so that's quite quite handy to do that in the same way if I wanted to do stuff that was coming inside so for example maybe I'm using the camera uh, so that stuff goes directly into the FPGA the FPGA then maybe pre-processes that video resizes it 
and then buffers it into again a FIFO going out. I can read it from those FIFOs using event mechanisms using the byte bus at a very high rate. Um, so I can do a byte at 80 megahertz, that's 80 megabytes per second theoretical transfer bandwidth between the two, which is exciting. We haven't had that in any other product. So that actually um, improves over what we had on black ice even when we had the quad spi there which was very limited um, the ability to do the memory mapping is quite nice but we might also build um, you know the standard clock clock block interfacing whereby you use fifos to deal with the different uh, clock domains of the expressive and whatever the peripheral was inside the ice 40 so that's quite exciting so overall it's going to be much more integrated than anything we saw on the black ice um, and one of the key things that i wanted with whatever the microcontroller i was going to use on here was i wanted to be able to run micropython or um Something else that's very interesting is Circuit Python, which is based on MicroPython, but it changes, standardizes some of the APIs, among other things. Um, why would I want to run Python on a microcontroller? Well, running Python is a really great way of putting things together quickly. Um, I just did a very interesting contact earlier in the year. I spent six months uh programming primarily in python which was very interesting for me normally it's c first and then a bit of python a bit of scripting etc but uh in this embedded example most of it was in python uh, and only a relatively small amount was in c where we needed the speed ups etc but in this case um, by having the python there uh the the micro python or, or circuit python C does most of the heavy lifting underneath. Uh, most of the stuff's written in C, and Python is really just orchestrating that. But it only gets you so far. If you want to do the real time stuff, you either have to go down to the C level to do it. Or in our case here, because we've got the FPGA, what we can do is start for the optimization stages. Once you get something working in Python, you can then optimize those parts either at the C level because we're using a C Python effectively here, or we can actually offload it to the FPGA. Um, doing real-time stuff's really difficult at the best of times. Big Ed had a great conversation starter on this on the forum recently at mystorm.uk. Take a look. It's definitely worth following that. Um, but when you come, even in C, embedded C, when you're trying to do the real time stuff, once you start getting one or two interrupts, it gets really, really hairy and difficult to be deterministic, properly deterministic in a real time sense to meet real time deadlines. Here, we can offload that to the FPGA. And the FPGAs are fantastic at real time stuff because they're parallel, they can do things very quickly, you can have lots and lots going on, you can always meet your deadlines. So in some ways, you know, the Python layer acts as a prototyping strike, uh, orchestration layer, an abstraction layer. And then the real time part of it can occur either down at sea level or more importantly here in Icicle, it can actually occur inside the ICE 45K and give us real real-time performance and I think that combination will be magical um, and in order to enable that I'm working on developing the software that integrates those to make that process easy uh, historically that's been rocket science um, I think we can make that actually very straightforward um, using standard interfaces and using that 8-bit bus that we've got we can abstract a lot of it away and have a lot of it based in libraries 
Um, the other thing that I will be doing primarily to get this moving quickly is I will be using nmigen to do all the hardware description models for everything that sits inside the um, ICE 40. The reason I want to do that is because I like nmigen. I spent quite a bit of time playing around with that over the last six months and it's nice. I prefer it to what went before it, the straight Mygen and Litex. I know Litex is extremely powerful, don't get me wrong, but I like the way that M Mygen is structured. It's very good and it's, it represents a really good way forward. There are going to be all sorts of things built on it, to, as we'll see later in the line. But the other key thing here is N Mygen, your hardware description, your hardware model is actually designed in elaborable python classes and what you can do is you can combine the ability to describe the model using mmindgen and the operational apis to that model all within python so i can create a class that describes the hardware i can also create the interface to that hardware in a single Python class that can then be imported. So there's a class that can be responsible for both synthesis, um, simulation. It also supports formal, which is great. Um, and a standard API set, which can be used to bridge to the Python running in the ESP32. That makes the whole thing much more joined up. So that's essentially where I want to get to with this. Um, so what that will mean is for people coming to the platform, even if they don't quite understand the HTML, HTML primitives and the designing inside the FPGA side of things, they could pretty easily get running by pulling in libraries of standard peripherals, like for the camera or for, for, for a frame buffer or that kind of thing. And these can be standard libraries that can be pulled in in Python. And then they've got a single language uh, to actually cope with this. There's no difficulty in getting them to have to learn Verilog first before they can get anywhere or VHDL or all those primitives and then they can start chewing off on bits of the HDL by playing around with the mmigen parts so if it works right how I would like it to work the on-ramp will be a lot less steep um, so effectively what we're looking at here uh, and I've made this point before of, this isn't FPGA versus von Neumann um, we're using a von Neumann or a Harvard architecture hard microcontroller CPU and we're using the FPGA but we're using them in a heterogeneous setup that has a relatively low impedance mismatch and it has a common language programming language that i think people can pick up quickly in python doesn't mean you have to do everything in python you can easily optimize pieces by you know taking that python writing them in c putting them in migrating parts to the fpga optimizing it there um, but what it does mean is you should be able to put things together excuse me more quickly And um, I certainly had some experience with that earlier in the year with one of the um, projects I was working on. Uh, that did have FPGAs as well, but you couldn't actually use the FPGAs from Python in that case. Um, that was a lot of mixture of Python and C really. Most of the uh, FPA stuff was done using traditional tools. And I was thinking at the time, wouldn't this be so much better if you could do the the whole thing in Python from a prototype sense, particularly a lot of the test stuff. 
Um, Python's great for the test, the unit testing stuff. So um, in that sense, this board is opinionated. Uh, I'd say it's nmigen first, probably Python first, either via MicroPython or CircuitPython. Uh, I'm not sure which way around I'm going to tackle those. There's a lot of work to getting those working. Um, but it is opinionated. That doesn't stop us using the traditional tools as well. It's still easy to use the Verilog stuff. Not only that, you can actually import the Verilog stuff into nmigen if you like as well. You can bring them in as Verilog modules, etc. So there's nothing stopping you doing those. But it is, as I say, nmigen first, and it probably will be, you know, Python first. And I'm sure I'm going to put some people's noses out of joint with that, but that's where this is aimed. Um, I'm just chomping at the bit, really, to get more people using FPGAs, bring more people into seeing the benefits, because once you start using them i mean take a look at the thread on the forum that big ed started very interesting uh, a lot of people have had that kind of eureka moment where they've been able to use the fpgas to do stuff and it enables you to look at problems in a very different way than you would from a very limited architecture like a von neumann or harvard architecture where you've just got very limited set of sequential instructions in order to get things done when you've got low level logic that can be modeled in code you've got some very powerful tools um, you've got some very good approaches for building things and you get a lot more for your buck uh, it can also be very good power wise um, you could put this thing into low power and have the FPGA just doing the important stuff and just keep ticking the uh, the expressive until it needs to wake it up, for example. Um, so in some ways, this opens, you know, my storm market up into something a, a bit wider as well. Um, there's a lot of, dare I say, Internet of Things. I hate that name out there. But there's a lot of small stuff where this thing can go into. It's very easy to plug into Feather type applications. But with the added benefit and the added power of having the FPGA, even if you just use it as a, some sort of accelerator, um, it does offer a lot of value. So it's got a different position really from what we've done at my storm before the black ice. And I think it was different enough for us to move away from the black ice moniker. I don't think black ice is what this is. That leaves me free, of course, if I wish to do a new black ice later, which I like to keep um, under my cap. Might be useful. So that's why we have a new um, a new name for this. In fact, on the last stream, um, it actually said something completely different on the board hold on let me uh boop, 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 where have I, put that? I tell you what obs hasn't disconnected for a while that's good i like that maybe it was gerd v that was interfering with it or maybe it was just memory yeah. now we can see our title here so icicle i thought was kind of nice because it's got the kind of ice bit because it does have an ice chip um, and icy cool because it's kind of small and neat and layered 
just the way that an icicle was made. Um, but originally, when I did the stream last week, the name that was on the board, if you, you go back and watch the stream, it said Bitflip or Bitflip, Bitflit or Bitflip. I was tossing up between the two, but I didn't like either of them in the end. It just didn't kind of work for me, really. Uh, and anyone that I spoke to about it didn't really find it appealing. Uh, so I went and looked back over names of things that I'd done. I've done so many different boards, so many different small boards over the years, um, wanted, but not been happy with them. Um, I was going to do uh, part of the um, stream. I was going to include a piece called uh, the graveyard. And the graveyard piece is really, or section segue, would be just showing one of the old designs that I have lying around, um, either electronically. In this case, the old design that I showed you today is the uh, there's the old zero that may be reanimated one day. I've got a slightly different design for this. Um, but that is the ice cool folks. Um, so that's pretty much done now. I will have to do a few final checks uh, on this, but I can actually be interesting just to show you guys what I'd normally do um, let me just see if I've got the job processor so I'm just going to process the job on this and that will give me some binaries and I'm just going to quickly bang these into JLPCB These won't be the final ones I order because I need to just double check a bunch of stuff. But let's have a quick look. Please fire away if you've got any questions by by the way. I'd love to hear them. Okay, pick all these up. Okay. Oh, I need to run the drill file. Hold on. Drill, 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 drill. Excellent. Open. Process. I'm just going to copy those and then I'm going to put those in a separate directory which I'm going to create now. I see put them in there and then I have to zip these up bear with me uh, send tool compressed it folder So now, let me see if I can go back to the browser. Let's add here. Hopefully I won't be sharing any account details. I should probably empty the basket. I don't know. Let's have my Gerber file. Yeah. 
add my gerbers to this what would this going to be look like because they do actually give you a preview on here which is quite a nice little test I can't find the files am I looking in the right place oh in it Infantrine. Icicle. Okay, it's uploading. Ta da! Very good. So it's worked out. So it's just like 23 by 56 mil. Not very big at all. Um, let's actually go and look at these, which is quite interesting. Can I zoom? I can't remember now. So what colour do you think I should do it, folks? Black? Stupid question! <laughs> uh, it's a shame we can't zoom in on that, actually. So no um, Ah, zoom, scroll, middle, mouse button. Well, that's what I'm doing. Is it shift? Control? Oh, no. Uh, oh. There we go. Uh, I haven't been using computers for very long, obviously. It's always good to do this because it. Um, I use GERB V as well to look at the layers individually. I'm, I'm bypassing that at the moment because when that was running earlier. My OBS kept quit, quitting. Um, so this is kind of quite a good way of viewing it. Uh, so that's the top. Let's see what the bottom looks like. Uh, I've got some labeling adjustments to do there. So here you can see the um, SD card socket. And there you can see the uh, camera. PC connector. There's the old logo, and there's some labeling for this array here, so that's going to need to be moved. That's in the wrong place. It's because I turned that layer off when I was doing the adjustments earlier. Um, so I'm going to need to do that. I don't normally use Emi, I just use that stuff. I mean, it is very nice, and if you if you've got edge connectors and stuff, great. But most of it's going to be filled with solder. It's all going to end up silver anyhow if it's pads and stuff. But it kind of looks pretty unique with the gold, man. We make of the gold. So yeah, that's looking pretty good. Oh, what's the analysis results? I've not clicked on this before. Minimum trace width greater than 10 mil. Minimum trace spacing greater than 10 mil. Layers 4. Minimum dual size 0.2, etc. etc. Cool. So if I go back. These are gonna choose black, man. I need Black. There you go. Special offer. Seven dollars. Unbelievable. Just don't look at the shipping. It's twenty dollars. <laughs> Nuts. 
and then normally I would also add the uh, stencil as well order together with PCBs and you just go for the small one here I did default settings are fine you don't have to do much much else um, I don't need any of the other stuff just a single stencil and that adds another huge seven dollars so we're doing about fourteen dollars I mean it's crazy mad however the shipping is going to cost probably as I say here $23 I normally choose DHL um, there's not normally much benefit of doing the priority in this case they are showing two to four business days versus four to six but I don't know whether to believe that or not um, shipping from china hasn't really recovered properly yet since covid a lot of the way that the dhs dhl stuff moves around um, is being effectively fed through narrow pipes uh -oh. Hopefully we're back. Sorry about that. It was pretty good. We didn't have one of those for ages. I didn't have any of these when we streamed on Friday. I don't quite know what's causing it. Must be something at this end, I think. Must be a memory thing. But yeah, so I don't know whether to believe these shipping times. Mmm. Hopefully we're back again now. I'm hoping we're back again now. Apologies, folks. I don't quite know what's going on there. But anyway, you get the idea. Most of the cost, actually more of the cost, is in the shipping. Uh, certainly in Europe when you're using JLPCB. The reason that I tend to use them, I mean, I love Oshpark. And I absolutely love their After Dark. But um, I like to be able to order a stencil as well, and you have to do that separately, Osh Park through uh, Osh stencils. And by the time you've done the two lots of shipping, it's like really expensive, and it can also take quite a while. So I found that the jail PCB route has been better. However, I haven't used them much through the COVID thing, and um, it does take longer. But anyhow, I'm going to get those ordered. Uh, I'll probably do it in the morning actually, because there's a few things I want to check before I press the. Uh, go button on that um but you get an idea the, the cost of the boards for prototyping is peanuts the annoying thing is you have to wait like a week or two weeks depending on how long they take to ship um uh snooze badger is asking a question about how i um how I do my prototypes. Well, my fa most favourite 
I don't know if you can see this, the lead on this isn't very long. One of my most favourite tools is my homemade um, little hot plate. The great thing about using that is if, if things are tombstoning or going wrong, you can just use the tweezers to reset the position and stuff and sort out the issues, which is kind of nice. Um, but I also have a, uh, uh, a T962, which is a low cost Chinese reflow oven. Uh, which works all right. Uh, I'm in the process of modifying it to improve it. Um, Peter Esden on Twitter. Um, on his blog, uh, he actually wrote up, I know it's written up elsewhere in different sites, but how to modify and improve um, the T962 ovens. Um, to make them more accurate by adding better thermocouples and getting rid of the shitty masking tape and putting captain tape and other things and updating the firmware. You can actually improve them. But yeah, so I use the reflow oven a lot. Uh, I use it to do the, when it, for, for the um, Black Ice MX comes in two parts. You've got the ice core which I manufacture in factory. But um, that gets combined with the MX board. This one isn't populated with the mix mod headers and stuff on to make black ice MX. Well, when I make these, part of it's got a service mount uh, connectors on it. So I do all of those in the oven as well. Um, so, do I use the oven or do I use the uh, hot plate? Just depends, really, on how I feel. If it's a double-sided board, the oven works better. You can't do double-sided boards on the hot plate for obvious reasons. Um, you haven't got the contact, and you're just going to burn anything on that's exposed on the other side. You can do one side, but not the other. Um, so, yeah, I always use a stencil. I always use solder paste um, and I either use a hot plate or I use the iron depending on which board it is as to which one I'm going to use this time I don't know I seem to be using the other more at the moment than the hot plate let me know if you've got any more questions about any of this folks You're welcome. Snooze Budgets said thank you. Um, so that's where we are with the ice cream at the moment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get that sent off fairly soon. I will uh, probably not see those boards for a couple of weeks, is my guess. So we're probably not going to see them on the stream. I will be streaming next week, by the way. But I'm trying to make this a regular spot. Let me know how you feel about Wednesdays, if that's good or not. Um, next week, what I might do, as well as the normal community updates, um, along with working on some stuff, um, I can do some building stuff, some soldering stuff. Depends whether I've got the cameras and stuff set up in time to show this. At the moment, you can't see that very well. So I could show you how I put these together, for example. How I do the testing and loading on the black ice. It's a possibility. Let me know your thoughts or if you want to see that. The other thing that I may be uh, able to show is the combination of uh, these not the boxes but the combination of these wired together which I'm developing the software on maybe show some of that I maybe do some of the software work 
which will be interesting. Um, using probably IDF to start with. IDF is Expressive's um, Integrated Development Framework. I don't know if that's what it stands for, but that's what it is. Um, it's all their libraries, um, all their command line stuff, etc. I mean, what I could probably show at least as a basic thing is um, perhaps getting the Expressive to manage the ICE 40, programming it, that kind of thing. So a look at some of that code, uh, the library part of that. I don't know if we will have chance to do any of the Python stuff uh, at that point. Um, that's a bit more difficult at this point in time. But I could certainly show some of that code set up as well. Um, again, if people want me to show anything to do with any of the MyStorm stuff, um, or anything to do with the hardware and software, just let me know. There will be a lot more software focus on the streams because there's a lot of software to do to get everything doing all the good stuff that I talked about earlier that's going to take some work and um, I want to be able to show that in the stream show what we're doing show what we're developing um, and how we'll be able to use that and add to that and if anyone wants to join in on the community rise um, contribute I'll probably have it all up on GitHub, etc. It'll all be open source, of course, just like all of the uh, Black Eye stuff. So I'll probably want to focus on that a bit. Um, I'm now just where am I? About two and a half hours. I think there's probably time to wrap it up for now. But before I go, are there any questions, suggestions, comments, anything else? Oh dear, yet another disconnect. I wonder if it's going to actually connect that up. Reconnecting. Okay, I think we're back up. Apologies. That was perfect timing. Just as we're ending. Fine, I, think. I don't know if it's our end or their end. Maybe they're having some issues. Um, Snooze Badger asked about M. Mijan. I will definitely be showing some end margin. Maybe not on the next stream. We'll see. Possibly. One of the other things I've got is I've got some end margin files for Black Ice as well. At some point, I need to put those onto the repo so I could perhaps do that as part of the stream. Uh, that's not all completely tested, but it might give you guys a chance to play with end margin in the interim. Um, enable me to show that so I definitely had that on my list we'll definitely cover some of that um, so for now I'm going to call it for the end of the stream a good evening for those of you in Europe 
uh, a good late afternoon for those in the United States or Southern America and um, for those on the Eastern Front, what are you still doing up? Very key. But anyhow, that will do for now. Don't forget, um, we have a forum. And uh, let me just remind you of that. At mystorm.uk. So if you just go to mystorm.uk, you'll see it there. I've just put the URL for the actual forum. Do join us on the forum. We have some interesting discussions down there. I know it's mystorm specific. But uh, anything FPGA wise is definitely uh, worth bringing up there. We will cover it. It doesn't have to be my storm uh, board specific in that sense. It doesn't have to be black ice or icicle. It can be general. And there's lots of really good people that hang out down there. Great are answering questions and love chatting about this stuff. So in the meantime, I will see you guys. Uh, next wednesday uh i think eight o'clock on wednesday is a good time no one's told me it's a bad time i haven't had any complaints yet i think it might interfere with big ed's tech shed whatever that is but uh hopefully uh he can still poke his head around the door occasionally but in the meantime thank you for joining me on this stream and i look forward to uh Spending some time again with you. These are recorded, by the way, and you can look back at the old ones if you, if you need to. I'm not sure how long they stay up there, but I am recording them as well. So hopefully I'll keep a, a good record of these. So stay safe, everyone, and um, look forward to seeing you down at MyStorm Forums or, or on a stream next week. Cheers. Bye.